Hey, uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. And actually, I've, I've had uh, in my academic or in my career, uh, I was not a researcher at SAP, but I was actually an engineer at SAP. So I've seen both sides of, the, of defense, right? So being really involved in product engineering, product development, and now I'm back in academia since already uh, six years, uh, which is, is a lot. Um, today I'm talking about one of my major lines of research in my lab that I'm conducting, and it's actually a joint effort also with Google, where I'm currently a visiting faculty researcher with a systems research group. But um, before I actually go into the deep and the depth of my research, which uh, as me as an academic should do, let me maybe quickly pitch what this is all about. Maybe every one of you kind of has maybe an idea what learned database systems could be, but maybe let me first set the stage. So I've been working a long time in database industry, and what users really want from databases is that databases are fast, right? So if you submit a query, you don't want to wait for hours until the result comes back, uh, but you want to have ideally your result instantly back. Clearly, depending on data size, this is not always possible, but the desire is to get uh, results quick. However, if, you, if you've worked with databases, uh, you know that this is not true, right? Even a query that maybe has run today in seconds might run tomorrow in minutes, and then you are kind of doomed. So the reality uh, that you see in performance of databases is actually not the pictures you saw before, but often uh, you, you drive your car, your database, into some roads where the performance is maybe not as you intended it to be. Um, the good side is, uh, for a long time, there was a solution to that in, da in database industry, right? So you could get out of this road by asking the nice guy who was called uh, the database administrator. So in the 2000s, um, you had to ask uh, the database administrator Here's my query, here's my database. This is slow, make it fast, right? And you didn't have to take care about anything. And uh, the DBA knew all the dirty tricks of uh, what indexes to create, how to set buffer pool sizes, and so on and so forth. So this was a nice situation because you could kind of offload your problems to the DBA. But un uh, unfortunately, things are changing today. So if you look in the database market, we see that uh, the situation is going clearly towards cloud. This is nothing new for you, but maybe the interesting observation here is that in the database market, what that means is that the cloud revenue is slowly taking over compared to on-premise databases. So in the on-premise world, you had your own database admin for your own database. In the cloud, things are changing. Uh, you are kind of outsourcing your database to a vendor, you might kind of use database as a service offers from Amazon, Google, Microsoft, or Snowflake, uh, uh, which provide managed database as a service solutions, and you have to trust in, in them that they kind of tune your database such that it provides high performance for the queries you are submitting. But for them, this is a huge challenge. They need to manage thousands or even more of customer databases and need to be able to provide high performance for those databases uh, for various types of, da of, of data sets customers come in or various types of queries users submit. And therefore, this manual approach of optimizing your database individually for every database a customer brings and for every set of queries that the customer brings does not scale at the size of the cloud anymore. So the question is what to do here. And this is where actually my, or the, 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 the things we are working on comes to stage where we, or where academia and industry are currently thinking about a direction which is called uh, learned databases. The question is, can they solve this problem for building databases that kind of can provide high performance for any type of data, data set that the user provides and any type of queries uh, the, the users submit? So the 10,000 feet view for this learned database direction is that uh, learned databases look a bit like this. So the promise of learned databases is that you build a database once, like a car, and it knows how to adjust to the situation it is used in. So like um, this is, my son would love this picture. It's an idea of transformers, not transformers as machine learning models. It's just a, a car that transforms into the most suitable thing for the task it should do. And thinking of a database, it would be a database that optimally adjusts to the data and queries you want to store in it and you want to use for querying the data. Now let me maybe zoom a level deeper and go into the direction of how these learned database systems should work and what the main idea is. 
So learned databases in a nutshell, what is the idea? The main idea is that um, in a learned database, what we do is we replace classical components, such as a database index, or think of any other component that is internal in a database system that is used to run your queries. This is replaced by a machine learning component. The question is now, why should you do that? Sounds like a nice idea. Machine learning is today everywhere. Why, why shouldn't we use machine learning in databases? But the idea here is that the machine learning model replaces the classical, classical component like an index with a component that provides near optimal performance for the type of data you are storing. So you can think of an index that adjusts itself to the data distribution you want to query. And therefore, the index, the learned index, can provide high performance for any type of data and any type of queries you run on your table, where in contrast, in reality, in, with the old world, you had to know which index to use and when indexes actually make sense. And the second nice, maybe, uh, uh, side aspect of using machine learning to replace database components is that you can get rid of this manual engineering and tuning of database components. So in the old world, as I said, you had to manually decide which index to use. You may, maybe had to set certain parameters of your index to make it fast and efficient. With machine learning, the idea is that we learn the parameters of indexes, that we learn an optimal index layout such that it can provide high performance on different data sets. Now let me maybe explain a bit the idea of an index and a learned index, maybe uh, just for those of you uh, who are not that much in database internals and don't know what indexes maybe are used for, to give you an idea of what the, maybe the first solution was to uh, bring, uh, let's say, learned components into database, because indexes was like the first work that kind of went in this direction of learned database components. So what is a classical, classical index? In databases, I'm not sure who of you, uh, you know here B-trees. Let's just raise your hands. OK, substantial amount. Uh, but for the others, maybe let me quickly explain in a very high level what a, what a, what a B-tree index is. So um, think of you, for example, here like you have a table, a customer table with, where you store customer data, like customers with their names, ages, and so on. And you want... <clears throat> to search in your large table, where, which might have millions or billions of entries, only those customers that have an age 40. So what the index, or what you can, what the index actually does, it's like a lookup function. You can ask the index, I'm looking for customers of the age 40, and the index, index kind of gives you a, a, a position where to look up these customers in your table. So you don't need to scan through your millions and billions of data rows in your table. But the index would tell you, look at row 15, look at row 20, and there you find a customer with age 40. And people have been devising manually indexes uh, that provide high performance on modern hardware. So database engineers that develop database systems have been really active in the field of providing high performance indexes. But still, indexes not always provide good performance. It depends a bit on what queries you have and what types of data you store on your table. So there was a, um, a, an initial paper in 2018 that uh, suggested to replace classical in indexes by a learned machine learning model. So the high-level idea here is, so instead of having a B-tree which implements this lookup function, you have a machine learning model, maybe a shallow neural network that uh, gets as input uh, the same search key and the output, so the prediction of the machine learning model is the position in the table where you should do the, lock, the lookup. And this initial work has shown that neural networks can learn really fast and slow indexes, meaning really fast and small lookup functions that translate the search key, here the age of the customer, into position in the table. And here is just a, a short plot from the initial paper that was from uh, um, MIT, co-authored with Jeff Dean from Google, uh, where they uh, showed this trade-off, uh, uh, let's say, uh, in what, let's say, what the benefits of learned indexes are, and here they compared learned indexes, or the first version that they developed for learned indexes, to classical B-trees and other types of indexes that have been developed in the database industry for years. And what this plot shows, there's a huge potential. So learned indexes, in a nutshell, can provide performance that is way faster than classical indexes at a storage footprint that is way smaller, because they succinctly learn for the given data distribution uh, only the, the, the type of how, how uh, the data is distributed, they, they learn how the position or which position to look up. So they can easily adjust their behavior to the data distribution you are searching in. And 
<coughs> maybe to go even a step further, indexes have not been the only example. So if you go to academic database conferences of the last, let's say, two years, you can pick any database component that a database internally uses to run a query, be it a query optimizer, be it a query scheduler, be it operators such as a join between two tables. And there, has, there have been papers that have shown that you can replace any of the database components with a machine learning model that provides better performance, that reduces storage footprint, and so on. So acad the academic world has been really active in this area and shown the wide applicability of learned components that replace classical database components. So the question is, why am I standing here, and what are maybe the pitfalls of using these learned components? And therefore, let me set the stage so how learned components are realized today. So what I'm talking about now is the initial directions of how people realize learned components, and then I come to a bit more the advances in the last few months, year, uh, half a year, where the, uh, where the field has been moving towards to, to solve the problems of the initial directions. So let me explain you how the state of the art of this initial direction works that I call Learned Database Components 1.0. And here the, pre the predominant approach is that these models have uh, been learning by executing queries in a database system and observing the behavior. And by observing the behavior, they could decide what is optimal, what is not optimal, and then they've devised a model that learns the optimal behavior. And therefore, they are called workload-driven workload learning because they need to run SQL queries on a database to, run, to learn an index, to learn a query optimizer, and so on. Let me explain this by a quick example how this workload-driven learning works to make it really clear what, what the basic idea here is. So let me take a very simple database component. So inside every database, uh, there's one component that needs to predict the query cost or the query runtime of a query. So given a SQL query, how long would this run on a given database? So on this database, it would run five seconds. On another database, which may maybe has more data, it would run 10 minutes. And this query runtime prediction is an important task because databases internally use this task for query scheduling to decide, for example, when to run a query, to which parallelization degree to use, and so on. So to use machine learning for this type of task, the basic idea might be clear. So the first thing is you need to run a representative set of SQL queries on your given database, observe the runtime of these queries. So for, for the different queries, you just monitor how long they run. And you, then you train a model that can map SQL queries to runtime. So the model would be a prediction model that gets this input, a SQL query, and that spits out a, a, a time in seconds or execution resources that are needed to execute the query. And at inference time, to use this model, what you would do if you get a new query, you would use this trained model, just feed the new query into the model, and the, mo the model would spit out a, a prediction, a runtime prediction that the query scheduler can use. And people have shown that this approach is highly accurate. It's much more accurate than the classical approaches databases have been using, using because databases use typically very simple heuristics and analytical models that are often not, not accurate enough. Uh, so learning and uh, this type of workload-driven learning has shown much benefits in terms of accuracy. However, it's still highly unattractive in practice. And you might already know why it's unattractive. I've, I've shown it here. It's, you need to run queries to train your model. And in fact, what you need to run is tenths of south, uh, thousands of queries just to learn a single model. So to learn one runtime prediction model for one database, you need to first run 10,000 queries, which might take on its own hours or days to run these 10,000 queries, depending on the size of your database. And then you can train your model. And when your database changes, when you have updates on your database, or if you need to support a new database, so meaning a new set of tables with very different data characteristics, you need to rerun these queries again. So you need to run again 10,000 queries. And this is, comes at a high cost. And if you think at the size of a cloud provider that needs to run a host thousands of databases ten, uh, times 10,000 of queries, and you need to rerun these queries every time data characteristics change in your database, then all of a sudden machine learning or learned database components don't, don't, uh, don't look that attractive anymore. Even though they are highly accurate and they speed up databases because they provide more accurate predictions for runtime estimates and so on, it's not worth doing it. So what we've been doing in research, and this is a line where my group has been heavily active in, is a direction called Learn Databases 2.0, where we actually want to avoid these high and repeated costs uh, of training 
models that can replace database components such as an index or a query optimizer and so on. So our contribution are these, is this direction called uh, Learn Databases 2.0. And for this, I'd like to, so we've been mainly working on two directions. I'd like to present one direction today, which is data-driven learning. I quickly talk about a second direction later on, but I don't go into detail here. For the data-driven learning, bear with me. I will go do one step in or deep dive into the technical background about how this direction works. So what is data-driven learning on a nutshell again, and why is it better than learning uh, or learn database components 1.0? The main idea is that uh, when you want to learn a model, such th the one that we've seen before, so instead of running queries, we have seen uh, that we can solve many database problems just by looking at the data with ru without running any query. So meaning, in the previous uh, example I've shown, you need to run 10,000 queries to come up with a good a query runtime prediction model, and we've shown that for certain type of tasks, you can completely ignore queries. You can just use a, a learn or realize a learned database components, for example, an index, without running queries. You just need to look at the data distribution on its own, and this is enough to learn a model uh, that replaces a database index. And this is what I'm going to do a bit deep dive in a minute. So this direction is promising because you can take your data and you can train the model right on without this high overhead of, of running 10,000 queries, as I said before. The second direction is um, something we call zero-shot learning for database management systems. So uh, why do you need this? Um, you might have seen it, so the, the data-driven learning is limited to tasks that do not require any knowledge about the workload. So that are kind of query agnostic and for those, you can learn models without, without this high overhead of workload run or executing workloads in a database. But there are some tasks like query scheduling, runtime estimation, where you need to run or have a notion at least what is the complexity of a query if I would execute it. And for this, we have devised this direction of zero-shot learning where the idea is that you learn, for example, a runtime prediction model on different representative databases. So we do some kind of a pre-training of a model that we need to do once. And then we can use this model out of the box for many new unseen databases. So whenever a customer comes to a cloud provider and uh, loads uh, the data into the, in, for example, in the database system, we could use such a zero-shot model out of the box to do runtime prediction for this new database without any training. So it's a bit like the, what you know from maybe language models that are pre-trained on large text corpora and then used on, on new text that it hasn't seen. We do the same thing on databases. We train models on a variety of different databases, and then you can use this model on an unseen database uh, out of the box. And I mean, I mean a model, I mean, for example, a model that replaces a, a query scheduler or query optimizer in a database system. Good. Um, I'm going to do uh, maybe five to 10 minute deep dive into this left direction, and I'm, I'm setting the stage for data-driven learning to, that I hope that I can kind of take you all with me because this is now going into really into, my, into, the, into the heart of my, what my research group is doing. So let me, for this, explain a quick task that databases need to solve day by day. So when a query like this comes into a database system, so this is a query that joins three tables, customer orders and order lines. Order lines are kind of the products that the customers would buy maybe in an online shop like Amazon. And this query wants to list all the orders of customers that are from Europe that were uh, ordered in the online channel and that had a, sm a price lower than $10. So what a database is doing when this query comes in, it needs to find something that is called a query plan. So maybe quickly, also again, just for exercise, who knows what a query plan is in here? Oh, okay, nice. So um, the basic idea of a query plan is that what it does, it kind of describes a step-by-step -step procedure how this query is being executed. For example, here you would see the tables on the leaf of the query plan, and then there's operator that filters out only the rows of the table for customers that are in Europe, and then the two tables are joined. This is a join operator which brings these two tables together, this, which is equivalent to this natural law, the join statement here in, in this part of the query. So what a database needs to do when it comes up with a plan is so-called needs to find a so-called good join order. Join order means should I first join these two tables, customer and orders, or the order and order line table, should, be, should they be joined first? Because depending on which tables we join first, 
the query might take, uh, might take seconds or hours to run. This is a bit the idea why we do join ordering in database systems. And the optimal join order, the better join order, depends uh, or database optim optimizes selected based on the so-called intermediate result sizes after each join. Let me quickly show you what intermediate result size is for this query. So for this join order where we first join customers and orders, the first intermediate result size after joining customers with orders might be 5 million, and the final result might be 10 million. So this is a notion, if you look at these intermediate cardinalities, how expensive is this plan to, to run in a database system? Now let's look at the second join order, which is just this other join order where we first join orders with products and then customers. And just because it uses different filter predicates, the first join result might be much smaller, right? So the first, here this join, intermediate result was 5 million. Here, if we join these two tables first, the intermediate result might be only 1 million, while the end result is clearly the same because it's the same query. It has the same size at the end, but the step to, uh, to actually compute the query, the first step is much, much cheaper to, to run. So what databases need to uh, reason about is, are these intermediate cardinalities? They need to find out what are these cardinalities without actually running the queries, because they want to know if I do it a query like in this order, it's much faster than the other order. So they need to come up with these estimates for these, for these, inter for these cardinalities before running the query. And with traditional mo mo uh, methods in databases, this is often the problem why databases don't provide a good performance because databases don't come up with the right estimate here. They misestimate the intermediate result size and therefore they select the wrong plan in your database system. So the question is, so what did, what did, uh, what did uh, machine learning do here to solve this problem? And there was a paper in 2019 published by Andreas Kipf. Uh, he um, uh, uh, was at TU Munich at the time and is uh, now working for Amazon Redshift team actually to bring these ideas into, into a cloud database system. Um, so he's been uh, publishing a paper where he showed that a deep neural net network can actually better predict cardinalities of query plans than the traditional methods. And what they've done is like, um, let's say, instantiation of what I told you before of workload-driven learning. They've been enumerating different query plans, so different join orders. They re re so they looked at the different uh, intermediate cardinalities of the different, of the different possible joins and used this to train a machine learning model that can do cardinality prediction. So what you could do, you could feed in any types of join of your database and ask this model, what is the expected uh, uh, cardinality, so the result size of the intermediate result when you would join these two tables. And his paper, they've shown that they can significantly outperform uh, classical techniques. So they compare to Postgres uh, estimates, which uses forms of histograms or sampling. They've also used other more advanced techniques, but, but they've shown that machine learning is much better in finding the, uh, the intermediate cardinalities in a highly accurate manner. But again, it comes at the downside that I mentioned before, right? They needed to run 10,000 queries for each database they needed to repeat, it, uh, repeat, it, uh, repeat the training data collection if the data in your database changes. So for this, we've been publishing a paper in 2020 uh, in VLDB. VLDB is one of the uh, flagship conferences in academic and industrial database research. VLDB stands for very large databases. Maybe some of you know the conference here in, in, in this room. And the main idea is, as I said, we use the idea of data-driven learning. So we learn a model not from queries and not from query plans. We learn it purely from the data. And in our paper, we've, uh, we've, we've shown that with a new class of models that are based on a category of models called probabilistic circuits, uh, we can define a new class of model called relational sum product networks. Don't, 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 doesn't matter that much. But the idea is that these models learns the data distribution within tables and across tables to do cardinality estimation. And what we actually do by looking at this example, which shows a database with four tables, we learn not just one so-called relational sum product network per database, but we learn an ensemble of RSPNs that allow us to do cardinality prediction. And in fact, what we do is if a query comes in, so let's say a query that joins these three tables here, we can still combine different machine learning models to estimate the cardinality for a join query that joins, for example, the store table with the orders table with the order line table. So how do these RSPNs look like? And now I'm, this is where I'm really taking maybe three more minutes to go in the technical details, and then I'm coming up again 
uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the more high-level ideas of machine learning models for databases. So, so what rela relational sum products uh, do? They learn the structure of a table. Let's now look just at one table to make it simple. Uh, and based on that, they can do better cardinality prediction. I just want to give you the intuition how this learning procedure works. The learning procedure is based on two steps. You do row clusters, you split your tables into different disjoint sets of rows that are similar, and then you split the columns apart if they are statistically independent. So what it does, it does this recursive procedure of creating row clusters that are similar and then trying to split columns apart that are independent, meaning that you can do cardinality estimation in these column sets independently. So what, what it does, actually, it takes here, for example, this table, which has only two columns, and it's a customer table where, which has two attributes, the customer age and the customer region where the customer is coming from. So here it might, you see, older European customers and some older Asian customers, but also younger Asian customers. And what it should learn is the data distribution of this table. And what it's doing, it's first, the first step in, in these models is splitting the, the table into so-called row clusters, which is shown here, maybe 30% go in one cluster and 70% go in the other cluster. Then we test for each cluster if the columns are independent. If they are independent, we would, we would split apart the columns into disjoint branches, uh, into product nodes of, the, of, of our model. And in this case, we would already terminate, and at the leaves of our model, we would store sim sim simple single-dimensional histograms. So in that sense, this is ver a very simple model that we would learn, but in a very, let's say, in a more general procedure, such a model could be multiple levels deep. In fact, it could be deep mo model in, with many, many different layers where we split columns and, and rows incrementally depending if, for example, we find some independent columns or not. So this is a bit the idea. Uh, I, can, I don't want to go into, into more details. But at the end, what you, what you see, you learn the data distribution of the whole table in this, in this uh, tree-structured model here. And how you can use that at runtime is, for example, if a query like this comes in, and you want to find out how many customers are from Europe and are younger than 30, what you could do here, uh, which would be maybe intermediate cardinality for the join of these two tables, you could look at the, at the leaf level of your, of, your of, your, of your model, find out that maybe in the left branch, 80% are from Europe and 15% are younger than 13. In the right branch of your tree, 10% are from Europe and 20% are younger than, uh, than, um, uh, than 30 years. And then you would just, because uh, we have an end operation here, you would just multiply them together, the, the probabilities to come up with the probabilities of customers from Europe and customers that are younger than, than 30. And then, since uh, they come from different row clusters, you would just add up the probabilities weighted by the different cluster sizes. And at the end, you would get a pr the probability of how many customers in the whole table are from Europe and are younger than, th than, uh, than 30. And we've shown that this model is highly accurate. So uh, in our VLDB paper, we compared to this original approach from Andreas Kipf that I mentioned, uh, as well as to many other non-learned approaches, Postgres estimates uh, and other techniques that have been used in databases or in, da in commercial database systems like Oracle, SQL Server, and so on. And what you see here is that the error of uh, our cardinality estimates are close to optimal in the median, so optimal means here the Q error. This, so it's a relative error. How far are we off? So a Q error of two means that we are, our estimates are two fact, factor 2x off from the true cardinalities. So a factor of 1.3 means that we are only 30% off on the average case, which is low compared to Postgres, which is factor 7 off, for example, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the median. And in the max case, it's multiple uh, orders of magnitude off from the, from the ground truth. And we are in the, in the max error, so the max, maximum cardinality estimation error that our models make are much, much smaller than any of the other models. The good thing is, and now I come maybe also uh, a bit um, to, to uh, the, the, the question, so um, uh, what does this work have to do with Python? Clearly, this is machine learning, right? So we, we've, we've been developing all our models with state-of-the-art machine learning uh, libraries and systems, and we open source our code. And the nice thing of open sourcing in academia is that this, that our work has been now reproduced in more than 100 other academic papers, and industry is taking already our source code 
and implements it in commercial database systems, which is, a, as an academic person, it's the thing you are usually missing, that people actually use your, your code. And with open sourcing, <laughs> yeah, it's true, right? So you produce this high, high so the, uh, these, so you work on, on some really nice ideas for many years, and then the result is a paper. And with open sourcing code, you actually make it usable. And this is what I try to also push forward in my group, to ask students to open source your code, make it usable, because then it might just be used as a baseline in other academic research papers, which is already good, or it might be adopted by, by industry, which is even nicer, right? Uh, good. Um, I've seen I have five minutes. Therefore, let me come up again from, this, uh, from the technical details of my work up to, uh, again, higher level of where, is, where are we going with our research. And here I want to talk about, clearly when I talk about data, learn databases 1.0, 2.0, the future has to be 3.0. Uh, it's not very creative, but it's, uh, it shows where we are going. So what, is, what does learn databases 3.0 actually mean? Or for me, what does it mean? This is a term that I'm using personally. So in learn databases 1.0 uh, and 2.0, the main goal of using machine learning models to replace classical database components was to make databases faster or make them reliably fast. Um, with Learn Database 3.0, we not just want to, let's say, take the database as it is and just make it faster, but we want to make enhanced databases, make them smarter, smarter by using machine learning as an inherent building block of, of databases to add new functionality. So not just run SQL queries over tables, but do many more things. And uh, recently, my group has also looked into the direction what many people maybe do today, but we've, I think we have our own, our own unique twist to it, is the question, can we kind of marry what language models do with databases uh, and uh, provide even smarter databases uh, than, than we have already today? So what are databases used for today? And maybe, so for everybody here in the room, it's clear, uh, they are made for managing and querying tables, right? So you have structured data and you can run SQL on them with some extensions for text, some mild extensions for text, not really, it's not text processing, there's some text search possible, but for now it's tables and SQL, right, that you can do. What we do uh, with this new direction of learned databases 3.0 is, uh, as I said, we want to enhance databases in the real world data is not always in tabular form. You have mixed modalities, you have tables, but you also have like uh, text and images. Think of a medical database where you have uh, reports of doctors along with the tables in your, in, your, in your databases, as well as images that you want to use maybe for querying. And our high level vision here is that we can make these other modalities seamlessly queryable without transforming them in tables first and then maybe querying them after we transform them in tables, but take them as is and run a SQL query over such a multimodal data set. For example, select me the diagnosis of the patient uh, uh, by joining the patient's table with a text collection where each maybe text collection is so there's a report for every patient in the database. And we've actually just submitted a new research paper we've shown where we can implement a uh, uh, so-called multimodal join, where we can join tables and text together, and the output of this join is again a table. But the user doesn't need to do anything. They can run, just use the database uh, uh, with text and tables uh, using a SQL interface, and the output will always be a table that comes back. So the models actually extract on the fly tables from text. Another direction that is even more exciting, I think, is um, uh, uh, an observation that at the moment we can only query the data in a database system that we actually explicitly store in the database, right? We first have to insert it and only what we insert in a database is queryable. So it sounds normal, but it, what it means at the end is you are very much limited to what you can get out of your database. You cannot just say this is maybe a representative set of data that I gave you. I want to query maybe just much more information that I didn't give you. And therefore, what we are currently working on uh, is a second uh, project of one of my PhD students, what we call omniscient databases, so uh, uh, databases that know what other databases don't know. Um, that, uh, so the idea would be here that we cannot only the query the tables that are in a database system that you explicitly stored, but we can query any other information that you might be interested in that is related to the effects stored in the database. For example, if you have movies, you might be interested in actors 
but you cannot query them if you haven't, right? If you haven't stored an actor table in your database. You can only query movies if you've inserted the movies information. But luckily also here, language models, for example, have a very uh, huge body of uh, common sense knowledge that you can use for querying. And what we do here is actually we use uh, language models to uh, augment databases with virtual tables. So whatever is in your database would be augmented by a language model, uh, and you can query tables that are actually never, that you never stored in your database. You can run a query like this on your database, uh, for example, here with a virtual join, you could join an actual table with a non-existing table called actors that we on the fly extract from a language model. And with that, um, I leave you here. Uh, um, I think it's uh, interesting directions in front of us, especially if you think about uh, creatively about how to combine these two areas of machine learning, not in databases, but for databases. And I hope that you kind of got an idea where academia is currently heading towards, together with industry, because all of the things that I at least showed in the first part here is something that also uh, cloud industry is thinking about. So with that, Thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Carson, for a very interesting talk. Uh, I was ordered to stand here instead of there. There's more light. So we have a number of questions that are similar. I'm going to start with the, the one that was upvoted the most. Are the query results deterministic and fully correct given that the nature of ML models are probabilistic? So um, the question is, is uh, are the query results that we get out of machine learning models uh, deterministic and always correct? So the good thing is, for many of the tasks that I've shown you, correctness doesn't matter because uh, the internal database components that already solve these tasks are not accurate and correct anyways, right? So if you think about a cardinality estimation component in your database today is already incorrect and it's, as I showed you, even more incorrect uh, than, uh, uh, than the machine learning models we are using. So we are not making the world worse by being maybe not as accurate and therefore um, uh, the, the in so being inaccurate doesn't matter because at least in that sense we are more accurate. Yes. Being non-deterministic is actually a problem because what it means if we maybe retrain a model over, overnight, right, a cardinality estim uh, estimation model is retrained and tomorrow we have a new cardinality estimation component. What means if we use this new model the query plan might change and the query that we've run yesterday might run completely with a different runtime today because now we choose a different plan. This is a problem because users don't want to get at least slower queries from, day, from one day one to the other, right? But this is a problem that databases today also have. Databases have something like uh, they run overnight a statistics run that recollects, uh, uh, for example, histograms of your data, and based on that, they come up with a good query plan. And uh, databases today suffer already from this problem of regressions. And therefore, you do regression testing with databases. And this is what we do with machine learning as well. Yes. So. Uh, we had a number of similar questions to this one, so I'm going to skip. Yeah. Um, and the next question keeps changing. Just a little <laughs> bit of patience. Pick one. <laughs> <laughs> Is it really a good idea to enrich your database with a virtual join from a Reddit fan fiction forum? Oh. <laughs> that was a funny one. I like the idea. So, <laughs> uh, uh, no, I think um, maybe to, to come back to the serious problems, I think um, Everybody knows so what the problems of language models are, and virtu extracting virtual tables from language models has its own challenges. One is hallucination, right? This is a problem known for language model. It might come up with facts that are not true. Uh, the other problem is language models have been trained on a corpora, and they only know the, the world knowledge up to a certain point, right? So usually their knowledge ends at a point in time. You can't ask about reasoned information in language model. So it would just, if it was trained in 2022, it, the knowledge is based on the facts it was trained on in 2022. Uh, so therefore, language models are being, for example, there is a new class of language models called retrieval augmented language models that can read in documents and extract new knowledge from these additional documents. And uh, so for the problems that language models have with extracting tables, I think there are interesting things for us to tackle, but there are solutions on the horizon which makes, it, makes them interesting also for databases. 
Thank you. The next question, in database 3.0, will people need to learn SQL like languages at all? Uh, using LLM, we could just use plain English, right? Yeah. So um, I haven't been talking about that. Um, I've been actually before language models already been doing work on something that is called natural language interfaces for databases. You can think of it like a chat interface for your database. And this is clearly also one thing you can do with your language model. So ask the language model, and this is what language models can already do today. Write an English sentence and, and ask it to provide it or to, to create a SQL query for your natural language statement, right? So language models are already a good uh, component if you want to build a natural language interface or chat interface for your database system today. And therefore, yeah, clearly, uh, so more natural language and chat interfaces for databases is something, something highly interesting as well. So now again, another question related to these. Are any of the RDBM, RDBMS workhorses, in parentheses, MySQL or Postgres, already come with some ML features in them? Features uh, that you mentioned. Uh, can you just repeat? So if these are database- Are any of the RDBM, yes. Uh, are, are there already ML features in the famous popular- um, de de Depending on um, uh, what you, so if you, um, talk about ML features in a way as I introduce them. So like, uh, uh, let's say, ML for autonomously tuning databases or make or something like a learned index. There is clearly a long history in databases to make them self-tuning. I haven't been talking about this here in, in this talk. So self-tuning databases have been, so people have been working on this already early on 90s in the 2000s without machine learning. And uh, companies like Microsoft and Oracle already had solutions. And for example, um, Oracle has now a product called Autonomous Database in the cloud. So what they've done, they've taken their, own, their existing world, uh, work on self-tuning databases and added a bit of machine learning at certain aspects to automatically tune certain parameters of your database system. So there is, to a certain extent, machine learning is available in commercial databases. Uh, at least in the big commercial databases. I'm not sure about the open source databases, how far things are there. So, okay. Uh, uh, does any cloud vendor currently support any learned databases? I think, um, so I, um, cloud vendors uh, are looking in the opportunities of using machine learning in a way that I described it here uh, for database systems. Uh, I guess I mentioned it. Um, uh, there are uh, uh, teams in these cloud uh, uh, vendors looking in these questions. And some features, you can look it up, I guess, are already available. For example, I know of Redshift, it has a partitioning advisor, which is not really using deep learning to solve the par data database partitioning problem uh, to automatically partition the database across multiple machines, but it's a form of uh, automatic lightweight machine learning that they use for this, coupled with some heuristics. So there are already solutions in the cloud databases where product teams are working on, and I think many more things are going to come soon. Um, so given it's around two, and we have many more questions, and a lot of them are similar to the ones that I've asked, I'm going to suggest that Carson will be around for uh, a bit longer, so you can uh, personally ask your questions from Carson, sure. and we can Happy to. keynote talk. Yeah. And all go, yeah? Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks again for being here.